Deuteronomy chapter 18. I've been anxious to get into some Old Testament texts and uh, hoping to do that here as we lead up to uh, celebrating Christmas. And uh, so looking forward to looking at Christ from the Old Testament and uh, just what the Old Testament has to say about this child who would be born that would redeem, save, deliver sinners from their sins and from the wrath of God. So I'm thankful for these passages and this opportunity. And so I'm going to be working and preaching and from a perspective I'm not used to. And so forgive me if I make some mistakes along the way, but uh, it will be truth. I can guarantee that. I'm thankful this morning for this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 18. We begin reading in verse 15 through verse 19 for our message today about the Promised prophet. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that that prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. Jesus, of course, is this promised prophet, the one that we are to listen to. Let's have a quick word of prayer for the message. Father, this morning as we look back into the very earliest of revelation from you to your people about this promised Messiah, this promised deliverer, this promised prophet, I pray that you would help me today to clearly share your truth, that we might be encouraged that you are a faithful, promise-keeping God, and that we can stand firmly upon your word, knowing that it is true that you are faithful. Guide and direct my words this morning and open our hearts to your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where do people go to find truth and direction? There are many, many areas that we can go to to find truth and direction. Maybe you need to check out, how do I fix this washer? And so you look up on YouTube, right? How can you look at a video? How do I play this game? The directions aren't very clear. So you look it up on YouTube, and we get clear, hopefully, directions, clearer directions. We are thankful for Google and for the Internet, and to a small degree, social media, for the opportunity to learn some things that maybe we did not know before. We're thankful for educators and scholars and professionals, because they guide us and help us with a variety of everyday things. There's other areas that people turn to, unfortunately, though, for truth. Cultic practices uh, such as New Age movement, pagan religious uh, systems, even the daily horoscope in the papers or online now, I guess you can get them there too. Unfortunately, turning to something that God has said, do not put your trust or faith in them. Several of these sources of truth and guidance and wisdom are not necessarily wrong or evil, although they can be. You've got to be very careful and discerning. One of them, though, is very wrong. And we must be very careful to obey God's word and to avoid going in that direction to find truth or even the simplest of guidance. But as we approach this Christmas season, I want to lead us through several Old Testament promises and prophecies, allusions to who the Messiah would be and who Jesus is, that we might learn more about him, that we might love him more and be encouraged to continue to follow and proclaim him. So this morning I want to begin... Uh, this month-long series of the truth that God has provided the promised prophet, who is Jesus, and that Jesus, this promised prophet, reveals God and his will to us. So we have the promised prophet, very simply speaking, in verses 15 and 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. What we have here in Deuteronomy 18 is 
a promise from God to the people of Israel through God's spokesman, deliverer, and prophet, Moses. Deuteronomy is the second law, or the second telling of the law. The people of Israel have been rescued from Egypt and their slavery there for hundreds of years. They've crossed the Red Sea. They've unfortunately wandered around the promised land, or not the promised land, the wilderness for 40 years. And they have now camped themselves on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And Moses, through the book of Deuteronomy, is addressing the children, who are now actually adults, of the people who came out of Egypt. These people that he's talking to, very few of them actually, probably actually knew anything about life in Egypt as slaves. And God was retelling them his law and what they were to do and how they were to live in this new land that God was giving them. And in chapter 18, Moses is giving instructions for the priests about this, and giving strict and severe warnings about not following the practices of the nations in which they are going to. As we read in the book of Joshua, the people of Israel are going to move into the promised land. They're going to conquer the peoples there. And they're warned not to be like those nations. In fact, they're, they're told, annihilate these nations so that you will not practice and they will not be a thorn in your flesh. And unfortunately, they did not do that. Totally. They were not to follow the ways of the wicked nations. And God gives them a promise to help them, to guide them. In order to help them to obey the word of the Lord, God tells Moses and the people that he would raise up a prophet like Moses for them to listen to and to follow. See, prophets were God's alternative to pagan diviners and necromancers. Diviners would be those people, men and or women, who would look at animal entrails or look at the stars or uh, look at circumstances around them. You were born on a very dreary day, so you must be a depressed and awful person and nothing good is ever going to happen in your life. Those kinds of things. And necromancers, of course, claim to be able to speak to the dead and get advice from the dead for the living. God said, you are not to have anything to do with those kinds of things. That is Satan worship. That is turning away from the true God. This prophet, God says, as we can see here, would be a fellow Israelite, not a foreigner. It would not be somebody from these nations around them. Just as God raised up Moses, he would raise up other prophets to communicate his will and mediate between himself and Israel. Somebody from Israel would stand between the people and God himself. And God fulfills this promise many times as the quote-unquote office of the prophet is created. And throughout Israel's history, there were always various men and women who God called to declare his word to his people. And that's what a prophet is supposed to do. They are specially called by God to give a particular message from God to his people. And that message was to be obeyed at all costs. Often this message could be a message of judgment, or a message of you need to repent or judgment is going to come, or a message of something is wonderful is going to happen to you in the future if you continue to obey God, or God loves you so much that he is going to fulfill his promises to previous generations through this act which you will witness. These messages were to be believed in and obeyed. We know many famous prophets that began with Moses. We know Samuel and Elijah and Elisha and some of the biblical writers, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. And there were many others in between. Men called of God to give God's word of warning, judgments, repentance, and encouragement. While there are many prophets in the Old Testament, main point of this passage is that God would send one particular prophet who would be almost exactly like Moses. And that was a big deal because the people revered Moses. I mean, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is called one of the most humblest people ever, which is a very high calling to, to stand up to. Who else could ever achieve such a status? We know that this promised prophet is not going to be Joshua, which you would think it would be Joshua, right? Joshua is going to be the next leader of Israel until they get kings and judges and stuff, but the next leader is going to be Joshua, and he's not going to be the prophet just like Moses. In Deuteronomy 34, 10, the Lord says, the writer here says, No prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. 
The moment that that was written, there was no prophet ever given like Moses. Not yet. But he was coming. And there's a key here. A prophet whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses at times would go into the tent of meeting and he would be in there for long periods of time and when he would come out, his face would shine because he was in the presence of God. God spoke with him face to face. A true prophet of the Lord would be known by someone who knew the Lord face to face. This true prophet that would be promised, that is promised. And also, as all prophets, their message had to actually come true. If they said something would happen, then it actually had to happen. And so these are things that the people of Israel could look forward to, hearing and seeing and noticing, this is the prophet. This is the one that God promised. We need to follow him. And that's what leads us through our passage today. Who is this promised prophet? We, of course, know that he is the Lord Jesus Christ. But how do we know this? The promised prophet, first of all, verses 15 and 18, would be an Israelite, would be a descendant of Abraham. Abraham to Isaac to Jacob through one of the twelve sons of Jacob, this prophet would come. Moses and Jesus were both born to Hebrew or Jewish women, descendants of Abraham. Moses and Jesus had similar birth stories. Both were born in troubled times for their people. Remember the story of Moses? You know, he was all the baby boys were supposed to be killed, but his mom saved him and put him in the, the basket and floated down the Nile to Pharaoh's daughter and was raised there. Jesus, of course, born in Bethlehem during troubled times, taxation season, Roman occupation. This is not a good situation. And Herod said, kill all the babies in Bethlehem because I don't want anybody taking my throne. Again, very similar times. Both were miraculously provided for by God. Moses miraculously provided for by God through Pharaoh and his family. Jesus, of course, through Joseph getting a dream from an angel to go to Egypt. And again, fulfilling prophecy there out of Egypt, I call my son. As adults, both men spoke God's word to God's people. And we know that God spoke a greater and better message through Jesus. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, and John 1. In the past, in Hebrews, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. But in these last days, He's spoken to us through His Son. John 1, 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and was God, He was with God in the beginning. John goes out throughout the book, showing how Jesus is the Word. Jesus announced judgments on the unrepentant. He preached salvation, the kingdom of God. He gave encouragement to people. He predicted future events, which happened, and taught the law, and taught about Israel's condition. God also worked miracles through Jesus, which authenticated his message and his character. In John chapter 6, verse 14, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, notice this, Surely this is the prophet. See the capital P there that's put there for a reason to help us understand that this is a fulfillment of Deuteronomy who is to come into the world. Again in John 7, on hearing his words, his teachings, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. See at the time of Jesus, there were many people who were looking for the prophet. This one who would be a deliverer. The one who would bring God's message of deliverance to his people. God also had a unique relationship with both Jesus and Moses. In Numbers chapter 12, God talks about his servant Moses and how he is faithful in all his house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. When he said this, when the people were like, why is Moses our leader? They were rebelling against Moses, which meant they were rebelling against God. And God's like, ah, he is the one that I've chosen. And the one who is to come will be the one that God has chosen as well. In Matthew 17, we see highlights of this with Jesus. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain. And here he's transfigured before them. And Jesus' face shone like the sun, a lot like Moses' face shone when he was in the presence of God. Jesus 
face did not have to shine because he was in the presence of God, because he was God. And these three disciples got to witness this. And his clothes became as white as the light. And like, I, later, afterwards, Jesus talks to them, who do people say that I am? Well, some say you're Elijah, or the prophet. Jesus is like, I, Elijah was to come and has come. I am that prophet. In, chapter, in Hebrews chapter 3, the writer there talks about how Moses was faithful, but Jesus is more faithful to a greater house. And we have greater hope in Jesus than we had in Moses. Jesus and Moses both spent time with God, in which both of their faces reflected the glory of God after being in his presence. Both Jesus and Moses attended to wicked and faithless people when they came down from that mountain after being with God. What happened when Moses came down carrying the Ten Commandments? He witnesses this big old party going on in this golden calf that the people are worshiping. Jesus comes down and he witnesses a situation in which his disciples lack the faith to cast out a demon possessing a man, a young boy I believe. Jesus is greater though than Moses because Jesus is God's one and only son. God delivered his people through both Jesus and Moses, of course. Moses through the Exodus and Jesus through the a greater exodus, a second exodus. This is attested to in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, when Mary is told, you're going to have a son, you're going to give birth to a boy, and you're going to name him Jesus, which means Savior, or one that saves, or a deliverer, because he will save, he will deliver his people, and not just his people, but all people, from their sins. Jesus was faithful as God's servant. He is our Passover lamb who rescues sinners from Satan through his death and resurrection, giving new life and a new promised land, heaven, new heavens, and new earth. We also see connection between Jesus and Moses as Jesus went into the desert and did not give in to temptation as Israel did. As Jesus was greater than Israel, Jesus was greater than Moses. And just in case somebody might think that, well, you're just kind of, you know, bringing a couple of things together that sound good, even Peter and Stephen some of the very first sermons given in the early church attested to the fact that this prophecy in Deuteronomy came true in Jesus. Acts chapter 3 and in Acts chapter 7. The promised prophet was and is Jesus. God promised his people he would raise up another prophet and we know him in Jesus, the Christ, the Lord of all. But why was there a need for a prophet? Well, we see this again in verses 15 through 17 the need for this future promised prophet. Uh, verse, uh, end of 15, you must listen to him, for this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. And the Lord said to Moses, to me, to Moses, what they say is good. The people of Israel needed a prophet for two really important reasons. First, they were so afraid of God that they asked for and God gave them a prophet and a mediator. Even before they asked for it. But they recognized their need for a mediator. When they first come to Mount Sinai, to Mount Horeb, God comes down on the mountain and flashes of lightning and thunder and uh, the trumpet blasts. And you know, it, it looks like, I mean, this is a terrible moment. I mean, an awesome, fear-inducing moment for the people. They're seeing God's presence come and rest on top of the mountain. They're told, don't touch the mountain. Don't let your animals touch the mountain. Because if you do, you will die. Because this is God's mountain. He is here. And he spoke. And he spoke in such a way that they trembled and they feared for their life. They said, we cannot listen to the voice of God or we will die. They had great reverence and respect for the holiness and righteousness of God in that moment. If only they kept that. But well, because they couldn't keep it, and wouldn't keep it, because they were afraid, they asked for a mediator. And God gave that mediator through the form of Moses, who would go up on the mountain, get God's law, and bring it down to the people and teach them. And today, Jesus is our mediator, is our Savior, is our high priest. He has gone before us. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is our champion. And he sits at the right hand of the Father for eternity showing that the price for sin has been paid. Secondly, the people were prone to wander from God. If we've read anything, even before they go into the desert for 40 years, 
even on the way to Mount Sinai, they wandered from God and complained. Where's the food? Where's the, you know, all this wonderful, delicious stuff we had back in Egypt? Where's the water? We brought us out here to die? I mean, come on. Let's go back to Egypt. They were prone to wander from God. They needed someone who could stand up to them and say, no, what you're doing is wrong and you need to trust the Lord to provide for you. Today we follow the word of the Lord in the written scriptures. If we ever hear anything from anyone proclaiming something different than what the Lord has given us in the written word that we are to turn away from and not support. Jesus, we know, is the better man word. These are the reasons why a new prophet was needed. A prophet who would lead people to their need for a Savior and trust in that prophet for their salvation. Jesus is that Savior. He is the better word. So we are a blessed people because we have the words of the prophet before us in the Gospels. Actually, in the entire Bible is the word of the Lord. And you have the Gospels, especially his words as he taught to proclaim the kingdom of God. And if anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks, notice it's not just the prophet's word. It's the Lord's words in and through the prophet. I will, I myself will call him to account. Peter kind of translates that for us and says that they're going to be judged by God for not listening to that prophet, to the word of God. We are responsible. The children of Israel were responsible. We are responsible to listen to and obey the word of the Lord in the scriptures. This is what people will ultimately be judged for. Ignoring or disregarding the word of God proclaimed to them or if they read it. And if they turn their back on it, that's ultimately what they will be judged for. You turned your back on the salvation that was provided for you. You did not listen to the promised prophet. This word is inerrant. It is inspired by the spirit of God himself. It is illuminated in our hearts and minds by that same spirit. And to turn our back on God and his word is to ignore the blessings he wants to give us through that word. It is to say that he is not truly God, but I am. Today there is a resurgence of, thus says the Lord, by many people who claim to hear a word from the Lord, either by voice or dream, that's not found in the written word of God. And that needs to be ignored, pushed off to the side, and not supported, and not listened to. We listen and obey one voice, the voice of our Good Shepherd, which has been written down for us in the Scriptures, and we can trust it is the same for all believers of all time. We are His sheep, and we learn to know His voice as we read, and study, and memorize, and are guided by the written Word of God, given to us by the living Word of God. So when we look for truth, when we celebrate Christmas, Christmas is a great time to proclaim truth. We can proclaim the truth that God has given us truth in Jesus. We can look to Jesus as the living word of God, who has told us about himself in the written word, for the truth of God's will for us. It's where we find out who we are, who we are to be, and what we can be as we place our faith in we find our need for salvation. We find the major answers to all the major questions of life in the written word of God. You might not find out everything like we want to hear, like, how am I supposed to fix this washer? Well, you know, that, that's a different type of truth that needs to be proclaimed and found in a different way. That doesn't really have anything to do with eternal significance. But the truth that we do know from God's word is when we're fixing that washer, we need to ask God for patience and understanding. So that I don't rip this thing apart and spend another five hundred dollars in the washer again. We've got to be allow the word to saturate us and lead us and guide us. He doesn't always lead us from point A to point B to point C where we want. If I go into this college, Lord, or this college, which one am I supposed to go to? Often it's not which one we go to. It's the decision making process. Are we seeking the Lord, His wisdom and His guidance? Are we analyzing what we know and making the best choices that we can make based on the Word of God? That that's how we use God's word for the everyday life decisions that are given in several forms. Will we walk in faith by what we know with God's word? He's given us his prophet. He's given us his word. That we would know him. That we would trust him. And that we would follow him. I trust that 
throughout this Christmas season, we will continue to proclaim and seek Him and promote Him as the promised prophet, the Word of God, given that we might know Him and have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank You for Your faithfulness to Your Word. We thank You for recognizing and knowing and pointing out and revealing to us our need for salvation, for deliverance from our sinful nature that can only be achieved by someone outside of our lives. You sent your son Jesus to be the deliverer, to be the one who would take the punishment for sin. That we might know you fully as your children, adopted into your family. That we might experience life with you for eternity. And that we might be your servants, sharing this message of hope and salvation about the promise keeping God, who has given us his son, we might know him and know love. Throughout this Christmas season, Father, may we promote and proclaim Christ. May this not be a season just about gifts, but may it be about the gift of Jesus, our Savior. May we continue to trust in your word, for we are prone to wander. We need your guidance and direction and call to repentance on a regular basis. Call to confess our sin when we sin, knowing that you are faithful to Father, help us to continue to seek you in your word, to encourage ourselves and one another with it, and to find the answers that we need for this life as we seek to live lives that honor and glorify you. We thank you for your word, both living and written, that we might know you and live for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, as we continue to begin our time of worshiping Christ, our Savior, and his birth, let us close today with the Christmas carol, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. We worship the Christ who has come already to die for our sin, and we long for the time when he comes to bring us to be with him for eternity. We sing the first and second verse this morning of hymn number 125, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. One,
Father, with great joy, we leave this place knowing that you are a God who is faithful to his promises. We pray that you would give us courage and strength to be faithful to the commission that you have given us to go and proclaim salvation in the name of Jesus, a child born to be a king, to deliver people from their sins. Bring us together again, we pray, to rejoice and celebrate this season.